Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. I really want to sincerely thank uh, Cussie and Jenny for just the sheer generosity. I mean, as they say here in South Africa, they didn't know me from a bar of soap. Oh, we did. Uh, we did. Well, through the, through the book. Yeah. And when, when I got this email from Cussie, he said, I am your biggest promoter in the world. And uh, he wasn't kidding. We had, we had a beautiful breakfast, and Jenny showed up, and she had my book marked up with post of notes all in it. And I just hugged her, and it so encouraged me. And then to trust me and allow me to come on the platform for The World Needs a Father. And I don't know, we've, we've thanked an awful lot of people, but can we all please thank these two for all that they do for us and around the world? Thank you, Cussie. Well, um, I am uh, incredibly anticipating God to do some incredible things here. And I've enjoyed getting to know you and making a lot of friends here. And uh, looking forward to visiting your countries as well. And Beth and I, when we are able to come, we're going to lay a groundwork of prayer and fasting with you. Because as you know, unless the Lord goes ahead of us, nothing's going to work. Amen? Well, we have a 13-year-old here, and uh, he's snorting um, a white substance off of his iPhone. And if you look carefully, that's not actually cocaine. It's zeros and ones. The reaction in the secular and the reaction in the church has been different. The church has, has asked me to change the cover of this, not put that on the posters, because it may upset and offend. That's been the general reaction. My publisher asked me to change the cover. Um, and, and by that time, though, I had self-published this book, and it was selling very well, so I had leverage, and I basically politely said, no, <laughs> uh, we don't need to contract. I, it, this is what it's about, and no matter how much we soften it and make it politically correct, when you read it, you're going to get that. And so this is what God has asked me to do, and, and we don't have to do this. I mean, this, but I'm very confident, not because I'm arrogant, hopefully, but because I know God is on a digital rescue mission around this world. He loves his people. Now, I'm going to tickle your nucleus accumbens to start off with. Your nucleus accumbens is in the nucleus of the brain in the middle, and it's part of the reward circuit. And the reward circuit in the brain is called the reward circuit because when we stimulate that area or the pleasure center, we are rewarded with pleasure. Now, we have a lot of countries represented here, a lot of different cultures, but I think because the technology now, the World Wide Web, uh, has leveled the playing field, I think we speak a lot of uh, more of a common language than we think. So I think we're all going to probably get this nerd humor. <laughs> Jesus sitting on a park bench with a millennial, and he says, no, I'm not talking about Twitter. I literally want you to follow me. I find myself in all kinds of contexts with different religions, <laughs> Muslims, and different within the Christian context, all different denominations, even our Catholic friends, which I'll make a nod to. If you can't see it, Father, I have sinned. This is the confessional. Now, that's Facebook, and he says, I already know. And this is called cell phone tan. Now, I also want to, before we get started, just let you know the proven uh, benefits that coffee has on the brain. <laughs> and I also sent a request in yesterday for our tea folks who made their presentation. Uh, as far as I know, I'm the only, only representation I think we've had as coffee drinkers. But anyway, I sent a message through asking when the tea folks made their presentation that they not wear their skinny jeans, and they did not. So I just want to thank them for that. One last thing. This is an actual real wedding video. It's a clip from a real wedding video just to show you how invasive and how addicting these technologies can be. This is a relationship which must abide in genuine love, remembering that God himself has established it by his means. By the high standard of love, God's wisdom gives marriage to promote goodness, happiness, and holiness, not by whim or option, but as the foundation of the home. Amen. The generation of children under perfect social order, and so it must remain until the end of time. 
Now, I don't know where that gentleman got his bride, but he needs a refund. It's over with before it started. <laughs> I know. Well, uh, very blessed to go around the world. Here in South Africa, I'm very, very privileged to be part of UNISA, the University of South Africa's Bureau of Market Research and its Neuroscience Division, and uh, work in collaboration with them. And uh, I was here just in December working on a research project. I'm part of a research team there, and we were working on what is called here in South Africa the blesser blessee phenomena. And we had focus groups in age ranges from grade 7 up to about age 24, which is at the end of university. And what happens in that age span, many of these young girls get recruited by men as old as 65 to have what they call an exchange. They bless them with gifts, sometimes just as small as things as hygiene products all the way up to cars and holidays overseas in exchange for sex. So we brought these young people in, and we studied the pornography issue, which 100% of the females and the males were looking at pornography. And we then put them in the neuroscience lab to try to uh, gather some information on their emotional well-being. And so a lot of that data is being crunched, and we'll write those reports when that comes out. But that's the work that I've been doing here. I'm very honored. We're from the U.S., Beth and I are. We come from the state of Virginia. We're down here in what we call hillbilly country. We live in these beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains. And we don't have very many people where I live. We have more bears in those mountains, I think, than we do people. <laughs> uh, but we have to drive to Washington, D.C., which is up here. We live down here. So that's where we're from. Right now, those mountains are full of snow. We uh, had a big snowstorm yesterday. My friends were sending me photos. Very beautiful. It's beautiful here in South Africa, especially Cape Town. Aren't we blessed to be here? to visit. The resources that people have been speaking about, we have this book here, Digital Cocaine. I wrote this book eight years ago, and uh, we've had to pull it. My publisher wants me to revise it, so it's going to be revised, and uh, I really believe the Lord has led me to shoot the video that will go along with this revised book here in Cape Town. So I've already spoken to these guys and another production company about uh, that when we film it here. But we have a DVD that goes along with the book, and obviously I can't cram the entire book into a DVD, but that's the highlight, and it'll be something similar to what you see here this morning. The latest series that I have come out with is called Porneia, which is the Greek word. For those of you who enjoy theology, you know that's the Greek word from which we get our modern English word, pornography and pornographic. I could not put this in all the bookstores and have pornography by Brad Huddleston. That would be not too good, would it? <laughs> so I chose the Greek word. And it's a five-part series, and it's been selling like crazy, and uh, groups are going through this, and so that may be of interest to you. I'm going to show you two minutes of a news uh, program, the most popular one here in South Africa, that I was very privileged to be on twice. This particular episode that they featured my work on, and others, uh, was the number one show of 2016. But I'm going to set this as a framework, and then we'll, we'll slow down and unpack this. So this program is obviously called Carte Blanche. For those of you in other countries that may be familiar with 60 Minutes, it's sort of that style of news show. The Lage family from Fourways, Johannesburg was excited when the little ones got tablets from their grandparents for Christmas. But things soon seemed to get out of hand. Tabitha realized her son struggled to set boundaries around his digital playtime. It started to become a fight. So Tyler would start playing on the tablet and to get him off the tablet was a concern for me. The long-term effects are a huge concern. The family had previously decided to do away with their TV because they saw the addictive effect it had on their children. Once again, that whole addiction with children watching TV constantly, being glued to the TV, not getting their attention. Tabitha and her husband rely on screens and social media to make a living. But they've become aware that screens hold the potential to harm their children. And as countercultural as their stance might seem, they're not alone in kicking back. One man has made it his life's mission to bring to light the destructive side of screens. I just released Digital Cocaine uh, about five days ago. Been working on this book for a couple of years, and its subtitle is A Journey Toward Eye Balance. With degrees in computer science and theology, Brad Huddleston travels the world to research the science behind screen addiction and help people. Just three years ago, we were totally unaware of the things that were going on. So when this tsunami of technology swept over us, particularly in 2007 when the first iPhone was released, 
We had no idea that these unintended consequences would develop. So this is Brad's desk at home. He shows it to audiences to explain that he actually values and uses technology. But it is burnt in. He counsels children and adults and helps law enforcement grasp what science is starting to show. Now you're equating digital addiction to uh, cocaine use. Isn't that uh, melodramatic? The neuroscience compares it to cocaine. And they're the ones that are studying the chemicals in the brain and the brain scans and they can show where things light up with certain activities. And so when you look at uh, a, a person who's addicted to pornography, for example, the same areas in their brain of anticipation and addiction light up as a cocaine and heroin addict. Brad says all that distinguishes South Africa from the world is that we're slightly behind the curve in rolling out individual screens at schools. Last year, a four-year-old international headlines after becoming Britain's youngest known iPad addict. Brad takes his audiences on a journey into the published literature on neuroscience and into the brain itself. The nucleus accumbens is where a chemical called dopamine induces pleasure. Now, we'll come back to that in just a few minutes. The reason I show you my desk, and by the way, this has all been upgraded now, as uh, many of you who deal with technology, uh, everything's gone 4K, and the 8K televisions are about to be released in the U.S., and I've already seen the 8K cameras at the National Association of Broadcasters Convention, and... Uh, it just never changes. I mean, it never stops changing. It's, it's constantly evolving. And so that studio looks different. And the reason I show you that is because I'm not against technology. I, have, I did not renounce my computer science degree when I started studying neuroscience and realized that this is cocaine addiction. What I have done after a severe burnout that I'll describe to you from a brain perspective and what happened and how I ended up being healed for the most part... Um, is why it is so lethal and why we must change our behavior. And most importantly, most importantly, what it's done to us spiritually. That said, for me, the foundation of everything I do is not neuroscience or psychology. It is the inerrant, infallible, God-breathed word, the scriptures. And if you agree with that, would you say amen? amen. The Apostle Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, gives us the guidance for every issue, I believe, related to things that we're drawn to in pleasure, which can lead to addiction. Not always, but it can. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. And then it's as though he draws a line in the sand, and he says, everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by it. I will not be controlled by it. I will not be addicted to it. And the great balancing verse comes from Ecclesiastes, Whoever fears God will avoid the extremes. On the one hand, I'm not going to say, look, there's a big barrel at the back, and at the end, we're going to burn our phones. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. On the other hand, I can't say, you know, God's grace just covers everything. Let your kids have all the Internet, the Netflix binging, and the social media, and all of that, and Jesus will sort it out and forgive whatever they do and heal their brains. That's not what I'm going to say either. We're going to be in the middle. The last thing I want to say before we dive into this very disturbing topic is that I did not come here to condemn you and to beat you with this science. These meetings, no matter, whether, no matter if it's in a university setting or a, uh, if it's a, a professional development and education setting, it always turns out to be a parent and a grandparent meeting. You'll sit here and you'll think of your own children and grandchildren, even though this is a conference for your ministry. You'll think of ministry and your people in your churches. But you, are, you, you care deeply about the little ones under your care. And what I'm going to say here today is going to be rooted and grounded in truth as much as it is in science. Jesus said, you shall, uh, well, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And until we pass through him, we're not going to find life and abundantly. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I'm going to tell you the truth today, but I'm also commanded to tell you the truth in love. And I hope some of you have figured out by now in these last couple of days, I actually do love people. And the moment we in ministry stop loving people, it's time to take a break. I've often said in moments of despair, dealing and working in church, church would be great if it weren't for the people. Anybody ever thought that before? You wouldn't say it, but you've thought it. But I do love people. So we're going to talk about technology in the brain. Here's some of the work that's being done around the world. 
And why we talk about cocaine so much, as soon as, there we go, internet addiction changes brains similar to cocaine. This has to do predominantly with brain scans, more specifically, functional magnetic resonating imaging. Most of you know what an MRI is. Now we can do functional, meaning in real time, you can watch the brain react as people do certain activities. You can put people in an MRI, put a helmet on them with the little sensors on the scalp, and they do this. And if we have time today, I'll show you someone in an MRI who is being shown pornography, and you can watch the addiction in the brain. You can watch the reaction. When you talk about digital activities, this particular addiction is identical to cocaine. And as I asked Dr. Mendez yesterday, wasn't that a phenomenal presentation by Dr. Mendez and Etienne yesterday? Yes, give them both a big hand. One is not here, but it was tremendous. I want to remind you, we're not talking about metaphorical addiction in children and you. This is literal. This is a dopaminergic reaction that never stops. D1 plus D2. It's the same as if they were snorting coke. Newsweek did a phenomenal article on this, and they gave it the title, I Crazy. But I want you to pay attention at the bottom. This is what we're dealing with, with all that was discussed with ADHD and, and a whole host of other psychiatric disorders. Panic, depression, psychosis. Now, if you can't see that at the bottom, that says how connection addiction is rewiring the brain. In other words, neuroplasticity, the malleability of the brain, kicks in which can work for you or against you. In this case, obviously, this 11, 12-year-old is cracking up because the chemicals in his brain have been hyper-stimulated over an extended period of time. The dopamine levels have never been, able, been allowed to come down, and this child has stayed stimulated, and now he has a chemical imbalance. In traditional drug rehab circles, I'm going to keep this pretty simple just to describe how addiction works in the brain. Many of you, if you're a mental health worker, doctor, you'll, you'll know exactly where I'm coming from, and I'm going to say it in such a way that I think you, you'll understand. Um, when you go to a party on the weekend, hopefully we don't go to parties where there's alcohol, but people do, and drugs, and they, they do these activities so that they emotionally feel a mania or a high. It's not to mean they're totally irresponsible people. They can turn irresponsible once they get addicted. But Monday, they come down off of that high because they have to go back to work, have to go back to school. And their body has built up a little bit of resistance to those drugs that they did, such that the next weekend, if they go to another party, they have to do a bit more of that activity or the drug to achieve the same level of mania. Body builds up even more resistance. They come down. And this process of having to constantly overcome the ever-growing resistance is what addiction is. You have to do more, 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 more to the point where you become hooked. Does that make sense? Because you're constantly overcoming a resistance. Some folks out at UCLA and their human behavior department and neuroscience division started to study the brains of people who use computers a lot. Now, I'm not talking just about people who engage with social media, Netflix binging, and video games. We're talking about engineers here who might use CAD, accountants who have spreadsheets and multiple screens like I do. Talking about computer use, period. Here was the result of this study. The computer is like electronic cocaine, fueling those exact same cycles of mania followed by the depressive stretches. And that's launched an entire new study into the brain science of digital addiction. One of the defining works, in my opinion, is from Dr. Archibald Hart. He's a South African. His uh, daughter lives near us in Virginia. She runs America's only digital wellness center on a university campus, which is Liberty University. It's the largest Christian university in America. It's in Lynchburg, Virginia. And uh, she read my book, and I went down and met with her. And uh, her, her dad wrote this book many years ago, and I heard him on Focus on the Family, gobbled it up, took our young adults through our church through this book. And it's obviously titled Thrilled to Death, but I want to point out the subtitle, which is How the Endless Pursuit of Pleasure is Leaving Us numb. This is the basis and the foundation of addiction, whether it be to cocaine, alcohol, heroin, meth, screens. It's all the same to the brain. And you end up with a condition beyond addiction where you numb yourself. And I want to talk a little bit about this, or probably in length a little bit, because this is where the symptoms are going to manifest. 
that you're going to be sitting there going, that's my grandchild. Oh, my goodness. That is my grandchild. Oh, God, what have we done? There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. No one here has purposely done what you're about to see to the children. The schools that I work in all over the world who have implemented one-to-one laptop and tablet programs did not do this on purpose. I didn't come to condemn. At the time, when I got my computer science degree, it sure seemed like a good idea. You know what I mean? You can understand the appeal. So I didn't come here to condemn anyone. I'm here to tell the truth. We have done this to ourselves and to our children. But most importantly, how do we undo it? Because we can. And if you remember from yesterday, neuroplasticity that can work for you can bring great restoration and emotional intelligence. It's a whole field of restoration and healing in brain science. But if you are digitally addicted, it will undo every good that you could have. You have to detox first and then apply the principles of emotional intelligence. Does that make sense? You cannot be addicted and apply good things and the good things overwhelm the bad things such that you can keep doing bad things. You have to stop the addiction first. So let's look at addiction visually. I designed these these brain animations based on his work on anhedonia and addiction. And I made them very simple. So for the doctors here, yes, this is an oversimplification, but I speak in schools to thousands and thousands and thousands, and I speak to the little ones as well. So I designed this so that even the little ones could go home and scare their, I mean, inform and educate their parents. (laughs) The nucleus accumbens. A few minutes ago when I showed you the cartoons, that is the area of the brain that some of you, when you chortled and giggled and laughed, that's where that emotion of joy came from. Now, the eyes are here, controlled, as we learned yesterday, by the occipital lobe. I'm not sure he mentioned that, but it's right here in the back of the head. That's where you see. That's where you actually saw. And this eye is controlled by this side. This eye is controlled by this side. It's crossed. Now, the ears, I stimulated your auditory, your temporal lobes as well. They don't cross. Those are right next to your ears. And I used auditory went in here and in here, and I caused an instant reaction. Now, here's the difference between the digital and the analog modalities of addiction. Analog meaning you drink alcohol. You put things up your nose. You put things in your vein. Let's say you drink alcohol, and your mouth is here. It has to go into the stomach. That alcohol has to migrate through the bloodstream right here. Well, in a bunch of areas, but just to keep it simple, the dopamine comes from at the bottom, and that dopamine that we learned about yesterday is the feel-good neurotransmitter that makes the euphoric feeling come to you. And so the dopamine goes in here into the nucleus accumbens or the pleasure center. It stimulates it and it causes a reaction called joy. If you put something up your nose, it goes into the sinus cavities, very close to the brain, gets into the bloodstream. You feel it almost instantly. But with the eyes, your eyes are directly connected to the brain. No bloodstream needed, so the effect is instant. That's what makes it so deceptively and subtly, uh, just, and you put, you put the seal of approval on it because the school is giving it out. You think nothing of it. That's what I'm trying to say. It's time to think something of it. Notice that wall that's building there. Now, that's actually a very complex chemical reaction, but that's the resistance that represents the, the dopamine barrier. And what that chemical resistance is trying to do is to defend the brain from too much of the chemical. Dopamine is not your enemy until you get too much. You need dopamine to learn. You need dopamine to understand your Bible. You need dopamine to feel God's sweet presence. But when you get too much, the brain builds this barrier as it were, trying to push out all the extra dopamine. And we don't like to be cut off when we can instantly be gratified with new pleasure. So as the resistance builds, what do we do? We look down more. Our head stays down longer. The door stays shut. And you say, put the game down and come to dinner. And things like, I'll be there in five minutes. And then five minutes, ten minutes goes by, come to dinner. And volumes are escalating on both sides of the door. It's because the child is fighting that wall. You become the bad person because you're the one cutting them off from their pleasure. And when those dopamine levels 
get lower beneath that barrier, they have anxiety because they stop feeling pleasure. They go into the depressive stretch. Does that make sense? And so they're getting hooked, quite literally. Anhedonia is the next stage beyond this addiction, and that's when the wall eventually gets so big that it becomes almost impossible to penetrate it. And this is anhedonia. And it's always been known about for years. It was discovered in schizophrenics, people with severe major depressive disorders, and severe drug addicts. You become numb. You become numb to your family. You start to neglect your work. The only thing you can focus on is that drug in large quantities because you got this massive wall in your brain that you got to overcome. And then in Dr. Archibald Hart's book, he revealed that they started finding this in epidemic numbers in children whose parents use the devices as babysitters. And that's the worry. Anhedonia had never been discovered in children. And now, because of the hyper overstimulation of their brains, their little underdeveloped brains, and if you're interested later, if we have time, and I haven't bored you half to death, I'll show you some of what we started yesterday with the children and their little sponge brains before they go modular and why it's so sensitive and why you have to be so careful to keep this hyperstimulation away from the little ones so that their brains can develop properly in a slow atmosphere around people and not cartoons and the photons that Dr. Mendez was talking about yesterday that puts them on overload and causes what appears to be ADHD and then we give it a title and then we medicate it now the one thing that Dr. Archibald Hart said that rocked my world is so simple but yet so profound this is why I used his book to to design these animations. It made so much sense. When I first started writing about this with the dark side of technology, 10 years ago when I first started researching this, I noticed that it was the devices and the video games that were causing kids in our church to not know God. Can I just say it like it is? They came to church, but they weren't interested anymore. I would speak, and the moment I'd speak, they'd all rush to the back and grab their phones to check status updates and so forth. He made this statement. It, it, these are spiritual principles that, are, that I can't scientifically say this is 100% true, but I think you're going to agree that God created our brains. Can we agree on that? And if that is the pleasure center where all pleasure is, is sensed in the brain and derived, if you are the type of Christian who enjoys deep, intimate, abiding relationship and revelation from the Word of God, if you enjoy what, you, what, we, what we felt here this morning as we worship, did you feel that, 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 that sense of the manifest presence of God deep in your spirit this morning as we worshiped? It's mysterious, but you felt it. And if you enjoyed it, that's where enjoyment takes place. And if you have a wall of resistance around that area of your brain, God gets farther and farther away, and we become more and more disinterested in him and we favor the more stimulating activities through a screen and that just it's so simple but it answered my question this is what's happening spiritually as well let me illustrate this simply I, I showed this and a, a, a grandfather came to me and I love grandparents I miss my own grandparents my parents divorced when I was four and it was grandparents godly grandparents I'm a, actually a reflection of grandma and granddaddy Stepped in, Bible bashed me, made sure I was in church, all that. It was awesome. <laughs> but this grandfather came to me. I have a real heart for grandfathers. And he came to me and he goes, uh, would you mind coming to my community and, and, and speak? I'd like to organize a community event. And I said, yes, sir, I'd be happy to do that. He said, well, I would like to tell you why I'm asking you. I said, okay, sir, please do. He said, well, um, after seeing that, this explains a lot. He said, I've got this boat, and it's at the mouth of a river at a big bay, and it's beautiful. He said, I rang up my son, and I said, hey, bring the three grand boys to me for the weekend. I'll take them out on the bay, and, and we'll have a great time. I want to spend some time with my grandsons. And his son said, yep, Dad, no worries. Let's do it. And so that weekend, Granddad had prepared the boat, got all excited about spending a weekend out on the water with his three grand boys. And so the son pulls up in the car. The three grand boys get out, and they had their phones and their devices, 
And granddad was so happy and looking forward to the weekend. And he said to him, he said, boys, look, this is going to be awesome. He said, we're going to leave the phones and the tablets in the house. We're going to get on the boat. I have cleaned up the fishing gear, the kayak. I've cleaned up all the stuff. And we're going to go out there and we're going to snorkel. We're going to explore the islands. I got three coolers full of junk food. It's going to be great. And one of the kids started to protest. Granddad, granddad. And granddad said, yes. And his grandson looked at him sincerely and said, granddad, what are we going to do for entertainment? Now, some of you laugh, but it broke granddad's heart because in granddad's mind, he was the entertainment. Because they have an anhedonic barrier. Granddad's analog activities of telling family stories and talking about the Lord and passing on the heritage and fishing and all those things produces the proper amount of dopamine, which is about that much. The problem is, they have tablets and phones and doing only Lord knows what with them. They're hyper-stimulated, so they have a barrier. And if they're not doing an activity that produces enough dopamine to penetrate that barrier, anything beneath that threshold is non-stimulating. Non-stimulation, by definition, is what we call boredom. And so they say, I don't want to go to Grandma's house because that's boring. I don't want to go outside and play because that is boring. I don't want to go to church because that pastor is boring. I don't like that teacher because he or she is boring. And it may not be the pastor's problem at all. It may not be that youth pastor's problem at all. It could very well be a wall. And so what have we done in youth ministry, in the West anyway? More lights, fog machines, higher volume, more instruments, not against any of these things. But you'll never, ever out-entertain pornography. You'll never do it. They will find all of your sanitized comedy boring because of the filth and the trash that they have to have to generate enough dopamine to penetrate that barrier. May I take your temperature? Do you still love me? This is what God has asked me to deal with because he wants to visit us again in an awakening. And I honestly believe that. My slice of the kingdom is... The digital component. One more thing that I'll deal with on this, in this context, and then we'll, we'll move on to something else. It's not quite as intense. It's not a, hardly a week that goes by that I don't see young people, and now millennials, who self-harm in some capacity. Most often they cut Sunday. I saw it Sunday. I, I didn't look at the cuts because we were at the altar and a lot of people were around, but in schools... Let me show you. This is a school of 2,200 students I was in. I speak in all different sizes. I have no, no requirement, by the way, for a size of school. I, I'm from Virginia. <laughs> I spoke at a graduation one time at a Christian school, and they called me, and I, I speak there, would speak there quite a bit, and they called and said, hey, would you be the graduation speaker this year? I said, you betcha. I'd be honored to. And he said, well, you need to know something before you say yes. I said, what's that? And he said, we, we only have one graduating senior. I said, I'm there. So I dressed up, put the whole penguin suit on, because you've got to wear suits in America sometimes and wear the tire of God won't show up and all that. And <laughs> had two in South Korea. No offense, but I took these suits to do a youth conference. I got to the airport, and before I took off to Sydney, Australia, I put all those suits in a box and shipped them home. <laughs> okay, I've meddled enough. But I gladly dressed up for her. I prepared for her. I prayed over that. And the whole community showed up that night for graduation to support her. I wouldn't trade that for anything like that. You know, I mean, you know what I'm saying? But anyway, I love it all. So this is 1,100 of them. And then we moved those out, moved the next group in. And this was in 2016, I believe. And I asked this group. I asked groups here in Johannesburg, well, up in Johannesburg and in parts of America I would ask them this, how many of you, and I would say, look, I didn't come here to embarrass you, so I don't want you to answer for you or someone in this school, but how many of you know someone outside of the school who cuts themselves? 75% of those hands went up, and that's in every country. 
Last year, it jumped to 85%. I would estimate five years ago, it would have been 25%. Why the spike? They come up to me all the time, pull up their sleeves and show me the cuts up their pants leg. There are places where they cut that it's certainly inappropriate for me to see, but they'll describe on their back or their buttocks and places where they hide it. Why are they doing it? It's complex, and there are many reasons. I'm going to give you three because I want to tie in the digital component. There is a digital component to the self-harm that results from having an anhedonic barrier in the brain. The first reason is the home is in chaos. Family instability. Father not around, or the father out in the mines working in another country. We've, we've discussed this here. I'm not judging anyone. I'm just saying there are consequences to this. My brother and I will tell you what it's like when divorce happens. Not mad at mom or dad, but it's not good. I mean, my dad, I, my dad wouldn't go to church, and so I built him a computer, and I said, Dad, I'm, I'm running around the world, and a lot of times this stuff's on the Internet. Would you watch me? He goes, yeah, I'll watch you. So I called him one day, and he started watching me on the Internet because the Internet can be a good thing. That's how I reached out to my father. I said, we're going to be streaming it Sunday. Won't you watch me preach, Dad? And he goes, okay. But I called him one time, and I said, Dad, I said, look, I'm going to be talking about divorce on Sunday, and I want to use you and Mom as an example. I'm not going to bash you, but is that okay? And he goes, of course, son. He said, go ahead. He said, I, I know it's wrong. And he said, I wish I would have worked it out. Tell him. He said, you should also tell him it's expensive. <laughs> it's my dad. <laughs> so if you contemplating it, my dad's was, don't do it. It's too, too expensive. <laughs> Chaos in the home. Number two, abuse. Verbal. Physical. And sexual. Now, what the first two causes is a negative cascade of chemical reactions to flood through the, the brain, causing chronic stress. Have you heard that here before? And they're looking for relief. So they turn to drugs, including screen drugs, to bring relief, distraction. What ends up happening when they get an anhedonic barrier in the brain that I showed you a few minutes ago with the wall, they can't get that feel-good chemical dopamine or, or it becomes very difficult for them to get the dopamine in. And so they trick the body into releasing a different chemical. These are hormones called endorphins. And for those of us who exercise regularly, you know what it's like about 20 minutes, 30 minutes after a good workout. You get that calm feeling because the system has flushed out a lot of negative stress hormones and replaced them with the good ones. And you go that is an excellent way to deal with stress. But the problem with cutting, what happens? They'll cut, and the brain senses that injury, and it helps them cope with that pain by flooding the system with these numbing opiate-like hormones called endorphins. And, and they're not talking about finding peace and relief from the cutting. That hurts. They're talking about the emotional relief. And I ask them all the time. They'll show me the cuts and they'll say, okay, why'd you do it? And they'll say, it makes me feel in control. It makes me feel peaceful. And they're exactly right. Those endorphins are making them feel peaceful. But there's a problem, two-pronged problem. Those endorphins dissipate quickly, first of all. So they cut, they wait a few minutes, the brain floods the system with these endorphins, and they go, ah. Then they dissipate, and if they want to continue feeling peaceful, what do they have to continue doing? That's why you see the tracks going up their arms and their legs. Secondly, they're addictive. And so a wall of resistance starts to build toward the endorphins, and so they have to cut more intensely. I was on the ABC, which is the Australian Broadcasting Network. I'm often on their media down there as well. And they interviewed me about video game addiction or something. And then they, and I've talked about cutting. And then they had an extreme cutter. And this poor girl had gone from the skin through the tissue. And in order for her to generate enough of the endorphins to feel, she had to cut to the bone. And that's an extreme case. I haven't personally encountered that, but I've encountered very, very extreme cutting. And here's my frustration. This is the, 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 the minister in me. 
the minister in me will stand in front of parents and they're lamenting, yeah, my, my child cuts and, and they're, they're so addicted to this and they're driving me crazy with Netflix binging. And, and, and I'll look at them and I'll say, what am I going to do? And, I, and time after time after time, I remember in Melbourne, Australia, I'll never forget this. It's like the rich young ruler approaching Jesus and Jesus confronted him about a heart issue that he had with money. And I'll look at this, this dad and he's just pulling his hair out because his kid is addicted to all this stuff and driving him crazy with addiction. And I looked at him and I said, take the phone away. And he looked at me, put his head down and walked off. That is never an option. Brothers and sisters, it has to be an option. You, there, there's no pill that we can give you or your children or your grandchildren that will allow them to do all of this stuff and not harm their brain. There's no pill that exists. We all know how the antidepressants end up working out over time and the ADHD medicines. You have to stop. In, in, in spiritual circles, there's a word we use for it. It's called repentance. Repentance. It's become a dirty word. I understand that. But the Lord said, come to me. Give me the burdens and take my yoke upon you. And that's all he wants us to do. He loves us. He cares for your children. But it's never an option. I'm the only expert running around the world that will tell you to take the phone completely away. The pushback that I get from the life coaches and all that is that it's a, that's unreasonable. That's not a balanced statement. To me, cocaine ingestion in children is unbalanced. I'm not here to make you feel guilty. I'm just I'm telling you the truth. I warned you I would for the purpose of freedom. Because as we learned yesterday through neuroplasticity, and I'm going to show it to you here in a different form, the brain will heal. I'm going to show it to you now. Let me talk about some of these various addictions, including the digital component, because they're all the same to the brain with different manifestations of symptoms. These are SPECT scans. This is a little bit of different scanning technology. This comes from Dr. Daniel Amen at a, at a clinic in America. He has this big machine that, that does 3D scans, and it stands for Single Photon Emission Computed Tomography, and they scan the brain 3D from the top and from the bottom, and that's a healthy brain that's nice and smoothed over, that's someone who's not addicted to anything. And now I want to show you a marijuana brain. There's a big debate in America now. They're starting to legalize marijuana in the various states, and you got the two factions. And my advice is don't get your legislation from a pothead. I'm serious. Don't listen to these people and people who support them. Do you want wisdom coming from that brain? I'm dead serious. You want to get people, wisdom from people who have this kind of brain. And I'm not talking about people who have repented and because, you know, years ago they got things in their past and they've been redeemed. Listen to them. They, they have more wisdom sometimes than those who haven't done anything naughty. Now, these are NFL football players who have chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This is concussions. Most of them, not from the, the, the Sunday games that we see on television where there are these massive crashes that comes from that, but mainly from practice, from little micro-concussions, just from hitting the helmets about that hard. And the brain is slapping on the inside of the skull, and it's causing these little concussions. And over time, it builds up a really strange protein that was discovered by Dr. Benedict Amalu from Nigeria. He was in America, and not knowing our culture, not knowing how big of a god that football is, he just told it like it was, and it just upset everybody. Well, he told the truth. There's a movie been made about this. Will Smith starred in the movie, uh, and he played the part of Dr. Benedict Amalu. I highly recommend you watch the movie on a screen. It won't kill you. <laughs> and um, have a look. But that's what he discovered. Similarly, that's the cocaine brain, which when you scan the brains of children, according to Dr. Nicholas Cardaris, who has a clinic up in New York, the children's brain look like this one when they're digitally addicted. It's, it's, it's digital what? Cocaine. And if you wonder why your child has such a bad negative emotional reaction after they've been watching a screen for a little while, that might just help you to understand a little bit. And that's a meth brain. Now, there's the normal brain. 
That's a heroin brain. Look how deeply pitted that one is. But of all of them, look at the worst one of all. It's the porn brain. And in my circles, I was just out in Los Angeles, which that's where most of the commercially made porn in the world is produced. And I was, I'm, I'm often there, big places, big churches. And you know what they don't let me talk about? It's rare that a church will let me talk about porn. They'll let it, sometimes they don't even want me to use the word because it may upset and offend. And yet statistically, there is no statistical difference in the pornography usage in the church as out of the church. The amount of men who are addicted to porn in America, these are American statistics, but we find the same in Australia and here. The ones who admit it is about 74%. Over half of the pastors admit it to having a problem with it. Sixty Over 60% of the youth pastors are struggling with it, and they have your young developing daughters under their care. It's a problem. But I want to show you good news. I'm not going to leave you without hope. There's a lot we can talk about today, depending on the time. And because, see, I'm watching my clock up here. So you, you tell me, and I'll stop at any time you get finished. If you get finished before I do, you just tell me. <laughs> okay. Because I, want to, I really I want to respect. But I want to show you something. Dr. Daniel Amen. these are the bad brain scans that I showed you, and the treatment do you see what happens? You see it start to fill back in? Now, the treatment modality, we heard about it yesterday. It's not, it's not rocket science. It's not years of therapy. Number one, it's detoxing. You, you, you have to stop. And then, and then we talked about HIT training, which is called high-intensity interval training. I do that. Dr. Mendez, I got so excited when you started showing me the pictures of the calisthenics that you have them doing, because I do calisthenics, which is sort of similar to CrossFit, but I do calisthenics because we don't wear the pink stuff and frilly stuff. We just, just don't you love our brothers from Egypt? We were, yesterday we were doing push-ups and pull-ups out there. You guys are awesome. So we have a CrossFitter down here, and I'm a calisthenics guy. But we joke about it, but, but we exercise because of the way, what it does for our brains. And how it heals. And then the eating properly. In a few minutes, I'll take you through some sleep studies. I'll show you what happened to my sleep prior to this conference. And I'll show you, because I have a sleep monitor that I wear. I'll show you what's happened since we stopped sleeping this week. We'll talk about sleep deprivation. But yesterday when Etienne talked about the, 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 what, the cleansing of the toxins out of the brain. That's why I set my timers for eight to eight and a half hours every night. And I have gone to great discipline to go to bed when I'm at home in the U.S. under my own control at 8.30 at night so that I can get in the gym before the Lord wakes up. I know he never sleeps nor slumbers, but it certainly feels like he's asleep to me at 4.30. <laughs> but in order to get that in, and then Beth and I have our devotions and we have our prayer time, and then we get in our offices. In order to get all that in, I've had to make changes. And the phone does not get switched on until about 10 o'clock in the morning because it gets switched off at about 4 and put in the basement. It's not in my room. I'm asleep. And that's how I recovered. We'll talk more about that. But the treatment of just those brief things that I've, Etienne described and what I just I do these things. I used to not. You know, there are, i got to warn you, there are side effects to this CrossFit and high-intensity interval training eating right. Lower blood pressure, compliments. I don't have to unbutton this button after I eat. That there's benefits to it, too, I'm telling you, <laughs> beside from the brain. Now, I want to show you something before we take some questions. We've been down this path of addiction before. We're very highly trained people academically. We're telling us that something was really good for us when in fact it really wasn't. This is not the first time the masses have been influenced by very intelligent people. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. They also went on television and smoked to prove how efficacious that it was for you. Watch this. 
You know, if you were to follow a busy doctor as he makes his daily round of calls, you'd find yourself having a mighty busy time keeping up with him. Time out for many men of medicine usually means just long enough to enjoy a cigarette. And because they know what a pleasure it is to smoke a mild, good-tasting cigarette, they're particular about the brand they choose. In a repeated national say, doctors in all branches of medicine, doctors in all parts of the country were asked, what cigarette do you smoke, doctor? Once again, the brand named most was Camel. Yes, according to this repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Why not change to Camels for the next 30 days and see what a difference it makes in your smoking enjoyment? See how Camels agree with your throat. See how mild and good tasting a cigarette can be. There's been a movie made about this called The Insider. It's all about a tobacco industry executive by the name of Jeffrey Wigand. Russell Crowe from Australia pre played the, the part. And it was all about him going into the archives somewhere in a hidden vault, apparently, at one of the tobacco companies and pulling out research that they had done. And they knew all along that tobacco was addictive. They were even adding extra chemicals to make it even more habit-forming. And they knew that if they could get people addicted to their product, they would make lots of money. And the trade-off was people getting emphysema and cancer. Eventually, when Jeffrey Wigand blew the whistle, court cases came about, and now this t sort of advertising is illegal. That's why in most countries you don't see it anymore in magazines. And doctors have stopped telling people that this is good for you. It'll relieve your stress and help you lose weight and all that. They now tell us to stop smoking. I'm not against doctors at all. I'm just saying if a doctor tells you that your child would be better off playing this education game, and I'm telling you it's addictive, if I were you, use your own brain to think through this. If the doctor tells you you should smoke, you should probably get a second opinion. They, they used to do that. So I've watched the advertisements go from this. I was in Cambodia not long ago working in international schools, and uh, now that's how they advertise. It's coming through Dubai. And you have to understand, this is in the corridor, the main airport in Dubai. Look what they put on there. Smoking kills, smoking kills. Brothers and sisters, education does not change behavior. Education helps those who are already motivated. So we've been down this path before. Now, I want to do one more thing, and then we'll... we'll I want to have a little fun with you because, again, th these things are, are deep and they're serious. But let's, let's just start the next topic of multitasking, and then we'll take some questions. I want to give you a little test uh, to see how well you do this. Where are our good multitaskers? Now, usually the ladies believe they outpace the men. I'm sure we're competitive here. So who can multitask really well? Raise your hand if you're a good multitasker. I know what you do. You're afraid. I'm not going to fall for this. Now, come on. Who, who, who multitasks? Who does it? Yeah, everybody does it. So the rest of you, I'm not sure where you stand with the Lord Jesus. <laughs> I'm not raising your hands. Um, but the truth is, from a neuroscience point of view, neuroscientific point of view, there's not one human being on this planet that can multitask. If Einstein were raised from the dead, he would not be able to multitask. The illusion is this. We actually, in my world, we call it switch tasking. The brain is a sequential processor. That means we unitask. We do one thing at a time. The, the illusion is we can switch between these tasks so rapidly it gives us the illusion that our brains are able to receive two or more streams of data simultaneous. But the truth is your brain, your children's brain, no, no matter what the, the smart people at school have told you about these devices, that child can only receive one stream of data simultaneous, and when you attempt to multitask, you put the brain in hyperstimulation. It is extremely addictive. It releases large quantities of dopamine, and it shortens the attention span. So what I'm going to do is give you the same poetry test that was given to us at the University of Queensland. I was taking a professional development course, and the subject matter was bringing neuroscience into the classroom. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is multitask, not 
three or four, five, six things. I'm only going to ask you to do two things simultaneous. I'm going to put a written poem on the screen, and then I'm going to have a second, a different poem read audibly at the same time. And what I would like for you to do is to pay attention to both of them, and then I'm going to give you a cognitive test to see how well you multitask. <laughs> Everybody focused? You ready? Here we go. The moon seems very lovely. Each night it passes by, so beautiful and shiny upon the velvet sky. And yet the moon is really dead. Its light is not its own. Though shiny it may seem, it's really just a stone. Okay, how many of you participated? Raise your hands. How many of you got two seconds into it and said, no, this ain't happening? Here's your test. Who can quote the first two lines of each poem? Not the whole thing. Just, just try to get two lines complete. First line. You know why no one has ever gotten it in the world, ever in any country? It's because you cannot receive both of those streams of data simultaneous. Here's what happened. Your brain most likely focused first on the written one. All right? Your brain cannot receive anything from the audible. But you're trying, so you quickly switched. Now you're receiving nothing from this one. How many of you, after about four seconds, said, oh, forget it. I'm just going to pick one of these things and do the best I can on this stupid test. How many of you did that? How many of you picked the written one? Lazy. Now, how many of you, after about seven seconds of trying to focus on the written one to get something on this test, started to get really agitated and annoyed at the one being read audibly, and you were thinking, shut up, I'm trying to focus now, here's the other problem. That distraction is now taking big chunks of data from the one that you're trying to focus on. I watch dynamics in audiences all the time because I'm a speaker. And, and, and people are polite. It, it, they, they have what we call crosstalk. And nobody's evil, but they'll, they'll start talking. If I were to say to them, and I won't, but if I were to say to them, what did I just say? They would go, oh, I'm listening, I'm listening. But, but they're not. And then I would, if I were to say, what did I just say? Uh, brain or something? Classrooms have gotten out of control with the devices because they all have the tablets and the one-to-one -one laptop and tablet programs. And as soon as the teacher turns his or her back, what do they do? They start switch tasking. And that one thing alone is what's driving the teachers mad. The principals go off to all the edutech conferences, get all jacked up on dopamine, and come back to school saying, you got to use this app, this app, this app, this app. And then they disappear in their office, and the poor teacher is left to manage all this multitasking that doesn't work. So here's how it plays out. Now, I just came in from America, and I forgot to put the S on maths. I tell the Americans, those South Africans are smarter than us. They do maths. We only do math. This is probably accounts for why we're 29th in the world, and Finland beats us. How embarrassing is that? They do math. So we should probably add some more math to our... Anyway. Kid sits down, and, and they all have, number one, a device with them. Number two, they all have earbuds in listening to music. Both are creating the poetry test effect. So their brain is already switching. A study was done. The question was asked. It's a very good study. I'll give you the quick result, but you should read it if you get a chance. How long does a student study a particular legitimate subject such as math, history, English, before they grab their phone? Now, you think in your mind how long that is. Remembering what Etienne and Dr. Mendes said yesterday, how long it takes for things in the brain to register with repetition... Two minutes is how long they study math before they jump to their phone. Two. When I ask the students, and I'll ask them very sincerely, I'm a researcher, I'll say, how long do you study math before you grab your phone? They'll say, oh, about 15 minutes. I'll say, how long do you check your email, check a status update before you toggle back? And they'll go, oh, two minutes. 
but in fact it's reversed because you lose all concept of time when the brain is being flooded with pleasure. So this process called toggling or multitasking, which is really switch tasking, is causing some of the chemical reactions that Dr. Mendes so eloquently spoke about yesterday with dopamine, D1 plus D2, it never lets the brain come down. And what they're actually trying to do with their device is overcome the boredom of the low dopamine levels of the legitimate subjects by flooding the system with higher quantities so that they don't get bored. But that constant interruption of data and not studying for anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes in total silence so that the hippocampus can register all of this and then all this gets transferred at night if they sleep properly into long-term memory, into schemas that was alluded to yesterday, which is a contiguous string of data. What ends up happening, that data goes into the brain in a scattered fashion. And as was correctly pointed out yesterday, they can't draw associations and, and in a practical way, teachers love it when I say this. Kid comes in on Thursday math session, and the teacher says, we're going to study equilateral triangles. And the student goes, but, but ma'am, you didn't teach us what we need to know to do this today. And she goes, well, we, we covered that last Tuesday. And then an argument ensues until the teacher pulls out the book and says, yes, we did. Evil little creature. Now, she doesn't say it, but she thinks it. Now, so this is what is causing the problem, and again, when I tell the parents that they need to work sequentially, and I'll put up the, the solutions here in a little bit, taking the earphones and the phone and the tablets and the television and the game consoles completely out of the room whilst they study in total silence is never an option, I suppose, because they fear the child. They fear, they know that explosion that will happen when you suddenly cut it off which is a brain issue. I believe it can be a spiritual issue. So that's multitasking, and it's had very negative consequences. So I'll show you this, and then we'll take some questions. Is that okay with you? Here's its effect on spirituality. Many times in conferences, schools, churches that I preach in on Sundays, Beth will roam around with a Zoom lens and videotape people while I'm speaking, and they don't know they're being videotaped. <laughs> it's awesome, isn't it? Mm. Breathe easy. She's not doing it today. Now, because I've seen many of you on your devices while the speakers are up here. I haven't recorded you, and I still love you. I haven't said anything to you. I haven't taken Yeah, Because he has, and he's going to show it. He's going to give me the footage. And, and you're nice. If I were to ask you, were you paying attention? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Because this is how we do with kids. Kid comes in. They're very emotional, and they want to tell you something that happened school and in their in their little mind it's this big and to you you know it's, it's a little but you, you're trying to hear them out but they know it's only a matter of time before it happens on your phone but they're just all emotional telling you what happened at school and all of a sudden in your pocket and so like quick draw McGraw which is a cartoon of a little guy that could draw real quickly it's an American thing we all have guns anyway he, he goes you go you grab your phone and you're looking at him going uh-uh uh-huh, uh-huh. Some of you have done this to other people, and you've had it done to you, right? And it's annoying unless you're doing it. Then it's okay. Okay, thank you for some. We've got one person who's honest and is going to heaven, and that's it. Now, so, so you're sitting there going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Now, you have no clue what they're saying, and you only know a little bit of what they're saying because you're switching. This happens at coffee. This happens in counseling sessions with pastors. I've gone in to see my own pastor, whom I adore, and three times he's, oh, excuse me, I have to take this one. I don't hate this man. I'm just saying he's not paying attention to me. I didn't say it to him. But if I were to give him the cognitive test, which I could, he would fail it. He was not, he's not paying any attention to me. And I've got issues like you. <laughs> so here's what happened. I got called to the podium in a medium-sized church. Beth had already mobilized herself with a camera, so I just, I just stepped to the podium. I'm just introducing us, and already Beth has locked in on this guy gaming. And when I show this in schools, children will scream out the name of that game instantly. So I'm about halfway through the message. Beth has positioned herself at yet another portion of the sanctuary, and there's a whole row of them on their devices whilst I am preaching. 
Now, this lady here seems to be annoyed because she's paying attention to me. They're distracting her with poetry test, secondhand distraction it's called. She can't focus on me because they're doing this. Now, they would say, I'm not harming you, but she, they are. They're distracting her, and she can't receive anything. This guy's asleep. And these are nice guys. I'm not mad at these guys. I happen to know they have cocaine addiction at a very young age. They can't stop. They cannot. And so if I were to walk up to these guys and say to these guys, hey, guys, how did I do? You know what they'd say? Dude, you were awesome. They would. I would thank them because they're nice guys. If I were to say, uh, why did you bring your phone to church? Hello, Brad. Our Bible is on it. Brad, we, we, we take notes this way now. Come join the current generation. Then the all-important question. Fellas, um, what did I preach on? Oh. Can you multitask? Dude, that's what we do. That's our generation, Brad. That's how we do things. Okay, then, what did I preach on? Brain or something? <laughs> now, here's where truth comes in. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is what they should have said. They should have said, Brad, the truth is you were boring. And so we gained from beginning to end. Brad, you're a nice guy, but the truth is you really don't have it as a speaker. You don't really meet my needs, but this device does, and that's the truth. So I went for what met my need, so that's why I did that. And so you have hindered me from receiving from God because you're not really that good of a presenter. So I gained instead to fill my time. You know what? What I just said is the truth of what they did and why they did it. The guy who was asleep, I don't know, but my guess is he was up late at night, probably looking at porn. And students come into school every day and principals lamenting to me, can you cover that sleep stuff? They sleep all the time. It's like, well, we got to talk to the parents. Yeah, but only 10 signed up for the meeting. I had one cure for that in Oklahoma. This lady was from Texas, the principal was. She saw me speak at an education conference. She brought me into Oklahoma at her school. And this Texas lady, she got on the phone and she said, this big school too, she said, if you want your youngins to come to this school, you better show up at the meeting or they ain't coming here no more. They all showed up, all 750 of them. It's awesome. <laughs> okay, have I helped you at all? There's a lot more, and, and there's, there's a lot more solutions, but that's, a, that's the start.